Good afternoon. It is a new season for Metropolitan Community College's Diversity Matters Lecture Series. In the 17th year, we're very excited to bring our virtual audiences a series of thought-provoking, informative presentations from distinguished speakers. See mccneb.edu slash film lecture for the full series. Your microphones and chat with other audience members are turned off. Send your messages or questions for the speaker through the chat function to moderator Barbara Velasquez. Also, please watch the chat for a link to an online evaluation. When you complete an evaluation, you'll have the opportunity to officially share recommended speakers. And today's session was made possible through the recommendation of Bonnie Fitzgerald, MCC history faculty member who shared our speaker's name with our office. So please welcome Bonnie Fitzgerald and her class, World Civ One. Bonnie will be introducing today's speaker. Hey, hello and welcome. Um, uh, Dr. Nicholas Breifogel is uh, an associate professor of history and director of the Harvey Goldberg Center for Excellence in Teaching at The Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio. He's a specialist in the history of Russia and the Soviet Union and global environmental and water history. He's the author and editor of multiple books, including Place and Nature, Essays in Russian Environmental History, Eurasian Environments, Nature and Ecology and Imperial Russian and Soviet History, Readings in Water History, and Heretics and Colonizers, Forging Russia's Empire in the South Caucasus. He's currently completing his book, By Call, The Great Lake and Its People. Since 2007, uh, Dr. Breifogel has worked as co-editor of the online magazine, podcast, and video channel, Origins, Current Event and Historical Perspective, and most recently on Picturing Black History. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Breifogel. Thank you so very much uh, for having me today. I really appreciate the invitation, uh, Bonnie and Barbara. Thank you for uh, all your organizing and uh, and thank you all for joining today. Um, let me just do, let me just share a screen here. And um, I want to talk today, I mean, I was invited to talk today about uh, the kind of the war in Ukraine, but particularly thinking about the history uh, behind this war. Um, and what are the kinds of things that we uh, that we should all know about the history of this region, uh, and that of course most of us didn't know, uh, or maybe uh, still don't know about this uh, this part of the world um, in uh, in the wake of the war itself. Um, again, I'm I'm Nick Breifogel. I'm from the Department of History at the Ohio State University, uh, and yeah, please send on your questions. I'd be happy to answer at the end. Um, what um, what I'll sort of do today is to talk about the fact that um, so this is obviously a war and it's obviously an incredibly bloody and awful war with uh, you know all too many deaths and 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 destruction in a way that I think we probably uh, will have a very hard time in understanding. I mean, the entire city is kind of leveled to the ground. Um, but in some respects, too, this has been a war about the meanings of history. Uh, and what I mean by that is that in the, in the lead up to the war, the Russian president, uh, Vladimir Putin, uh, wrote an essay um, called uh, On the Historical Unity of Russians and Ukrainians. Uh, now, at the time this came out, I don't think many people paid a great deal of attention uh, to what this meant. But in many respects, uh, in this document, uh, Putin lays out a vision for the history of this region uh, and an excuse, ultimately, a legitim uh, legitimacy for the invasion or justification for the invasion. Uh, and, and, and in great part, the, this document makes the argument wrong. It's, it's, a, it's wrong. It's an incorrect kind of argument, but it's still... This is what this um, uh, what this document says uh, that basically Ukrainians don't exist uh, and really have never existed. Uh, that the Ukrainian people, as we understand them today, in Putin's view, are simply Russians who have sort of been artificially separated from the rest of Russia. Uh, so, in many respects, his view of the history of this region is one in which this invasion 
isn't an invasion at all, but rather it's a it's a, a reamalgamation of people who are always supposed to be together uh, in his mind. Uh, that there are, as he said, from his perspective, there are no Ukrainians uh, and there are only Russians. Uh, and and I think that uh, you know we get the sense that to a certain degree. Uh, this has been a big part of the propaganda that the, the Russian government has used to, to convince soldiers that this is a war worth fighting for. Uh, and, you know, we have seen it in instant, instance after instance after instance where Russian soldiers coming into Ukrainian towns and villages so often come up to the local population and say, we're here to liberate you. We're here to bring you back uh, to uh, where you belong in Russia. Uh, we're here to kind of recreate a unified Russian place and you'll come back to your real sort of home and just soldiers uh, repeating these ideas. And so this war over history is, uh, is important, not just whether you get the history right or not, uh, but it's important because it's being utilized uh, by the Russian political leadership and by uh, and by everyday soldiers in the middle of this fight to, to, to make sense of and to justify uh, what's going on in the war. So this, this matters a great deal uh, that, um, that this is the historical vision that the, uh, that the Russian government has been putting forward. Now, what I wanna do today is to talk a little bit about uh, you know, some key moments in the history of this region, really to kind of highlight that the idea that there's never been uh, a, a Ukrainian people nor a Ukrainian state uh, is is not it's 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 not correct uh, ultimately that the um, that, that Putin's efforts to kind of rewrite history uh, is just simply a, in many respects just a falsehood uh, and um, so I'm hoping perhaps to arm us with a little bit of an understanding of this region and particularly to think about. What are the big moments uh, in in the history of, uh, of of you know of of this region that we now call uh, that we now call Ukraine? You can see on oops sorry you can see on the uh, on the map here. Uh, this is the uh, the current borders of the of uh, or at least the, these were the borders of uh, of Ukraine before uh, sort of post 1991 and before the Russian uh, invasion. Um, and so getting a sense of what the key moments are in the history of this, this part of the world, uh, and then really highlighting the ways in which um, we should pay attention to certain things in particular. One is just how important uh, Europe's great powers, uh, or really the world's great powers have been in determining the fate of the, of the, of the lands and peoples of this region. Uh, they haven't always been able to determine their own kind of future uh, or their own sort of, uh, social and political reality. Uh, and as a big part of this, relations with Russia and Poland, other parts of the uh, European continent are tremendously important. Um, I want to highlight some of the, the sort of linguistic identity and kind of cultural differences and similarities in this particular region uh, and highlight also the ways in which this is a region of tremendous natural resources. Um, agriculture uh, uh, being just one of them, but uh, you know fossil fuels, hydroelectric power, uh, most recently nuclear power, uh, all sorts of um, uh, of, uh, of of mining and other types of uh, of kind of mineral resources, uh, industrial complexes. I mean, it's a very important um, uh, it's a very important industrial uh, and agricultural region for the region and uh, sorry and for that part of the world but also for for the planet i mean if if you've been following recently uh there's been just a huge effort uh, undertaken to try to get some of the um uh the ukrainian crops out of uh of ukraine and out to the rest of the world where uh they're needed for people to live so uh this is a place then that has a long history of being influenced by people outside of it um and uh, you know, is a place of, of great kind of importance uh, in terms of resources. Uh, so that's what I want to do. I want to kind of give the history that I, I wish Putin had written in, uh, you know, in the um, in this essay, but he writes a completely different one. Uh, again, one that's very false, uh, and one that I'm sort of hoping to uh, to uh, to push back against, so we actually understand what's going on in this part of the world. All right, so. 
let's take us to the beginning point uh, in this whole uh, process. Um, in many respects, the whole story of the history of this uh, of this region of these peoples uh, goes back to uh, a, a sort of time and place known as Kievan Rus. Uh, so uh, it's a period that lasts, as you can see from the slide, about 400 years. Um, it is a, 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 a really large uh, political medieval state um, that you can sort of see the green uh, on, the, uh, on the map here. Uh, this was Kiev Rus. Um, it was a, a massive country, the largest <coughs> um, uh, country in Europe uh, during the medieval period. Uh, and uh, it was in many respects the kind of first time that the peoples who lived in this part of the world were integrated together uh, into you know, one political uh, entity uh, and a very big one and a very powerful one and one that had connections uh, you know, across Europe and, and to all sorts of other parts of, uh, uh, of the world. Uh, and um, based in the city of Kiev, hence Kievan Rus, uh, and known as Rus, uh, uh, as, a, as a kind of name for the country that is different from any of the names that exist today. So it was a time period where it's a different type of political um, uh, system and a different type of, uh, of state, uh, and, uh, and but extraordinarily important at that time. A couple of important things about this. So first, well, that this is a time of uh, the first kind of political unity of, uh, of the different Slavic peoples who lived in this area. The second uh, really important thing about this moment is that it was at this point that the peoples of this region converted uh, to Christianity. Uh, and um, this happens in 988. Uh, and uh, they, um, I mean, they convert to Christianity, which later, uh, because of the split of, uh, of Christianity in 1054 between the East and the Western churches, um, they eventually become Orthodox. They're lumped in with the East with the, the Orthodox Christians. Um, but it's this is the time where Christianity comes to this part of uh, of, uh, of of the continent, um, connecting it then with with Christian centers throughout the Middle East, North Africa, uh, and other parts of Europe. Um, this this kind of medieval kingdom uh, is also important today uh, because uh, all the kind of countries in this region, so. Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia all claim this state as their beginnings. Uh, so Russia says, well, given the Rus is our start. Um, <clears throat> Ukraine says, this is our start. Belarus says, this is our start. Uh, and uh, there's this sort of sense of uh, all of these countries looking back in time to say, yeah, this is our beginning point. This is our origin story. This is our genesis right here. Uh, and then claiming all of the success and vibrancy of this region uh, and of this uh, of, of, uh, of this state for you know for themselves. And of course, can't be the beginning of everybody. Uh, and so there's a, a tension and debate uh, uh, over this whole question. It's really, in some respects, neither the beginning. Uh, it's it's it is both neither the beginning of any of all these states uh, and also simultaneously. Yes, the beginning of all these states, uh, in the sense that it's a long time ago, uh, and a lot happened in between, uh, and so there's no continuity that moves from one place to the other, or one time to the other, but this is the first moment that you have this kind of unity, certainly for Russia and for, for uh, people writing the history that Putin is saying, they believe that Kievan Rus is the beginning of Russia, therefore, Kiev was from the very beginning part of Russia. They're really angered by the fact that, you know, Kiev and these territories have been separated uh, from the Russian state. So they're, uh, you know, they're saying, well, we go back to Kiev Murus, we have a right to be here. Ukrainians are saying, no, 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 Kiev Murus is our beginning, not yours. Uh, and your beginnings are somewhere else. Uh, and they're saying, you know, this was, this was our beginning. So it's, it's a historical debate over these things. What's important about it is this political unity, is the, uh, the, um, uh, the conversion to uh, to orthodoxy and the extraordinarily powerful and important place uh, of Kiev and Rus in uh, European medieval society. Now, Kiev and Rus fell apart uh, in uh, in the in the kind of early part of the 13th century in great part uh, in great uh, respect because of 
the invasion of the Mongols. Uh, the Mongol Empire, one of the greatest empires that the world has ever seen, uh, pushed from east to west uh, across um, uh, you know, Asia and into Europe, uh, one of the most formidable armies the world has ever seen, uh, you know, horseback, archers, uh, remarkable uh, kind of fighting force taking over just about everybody as they went. Um, they make it all the way in just basically to, to Hungary, uh, what's today Hungary, I should say. Uh, and with that, there's a fracturing of, uh, of, the, of, of Kiev and the Rus into all sorts of different pieces. So what had been unity now falls apart into a variety of different, uh, different smaller states and, um, uh, and, uh, and different kind of principalities and areas. Uh, so there's a kind of, if there was a moment of unity now, there's, there's a long period of kind of fragmentation uh, of the different peoples who live in this region. Um, now, there's an effort uh, on the part of, uh, <clears throat> of great powers in the region to, in, in some respects, to kind of fill in a little bit of the void or the vacuum uh, from this fragmentation. Uh, and when it comes to the people in if what, what's now Ukraine, so this area down here, um, this, the, the outside powers coming in are, are in some ways two. Uh, the first and perhaps most important is the, um, uh, is the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Uh, it's not a country that many people know particularly well. Uh, it was uh, in, uh, in the sort of early modern period, by far the, 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 uh, the largest, the strongest, most influential uh, country in Europe. Uh, and, uh, and one of the, when basically the first constitutional state uh, in, um, uh, in, in, in what we now call uh, Europe. And, uh, and so a very important uh, uh, part of, uh, of, of the European continent, uh, well known for, uh, for its religious toleration uh, and for its, uh, its, kind of, uh, its political participation for a certain group of, uh, of, uh, of elites. Um, it pushed to kind of, uh, as the Mongols weakened, they start to, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth pushes down to take over more and more territory in what, what we now call uh, Ukraine. What's important about this moment in, in particular uh, was that as a result of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth coming into this area, sort of down uh, into here, we start to see uh, an influence on the people living there of the Polish language, uh, which is a Slavic language like Russian, but different in terms of pronunciation and words and this sort of thing, uh, influence of Polish culture, uh, and in particular, the influence of Roman Catholicism. Uh, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, um, uh, very tolerant state when, as it came to religious, different religious groups, but was a Catholic state uh, that is representing the kind of Western church uh, based in Rome. The, uh, the people in this region had been part of kind of Orthodox or Eastern Christianity. So you start to have a a meeting point between these two uh, Christian communities uh, it didn't always go well. Uh, they had very strong disagreements over exactly how Christianity was supposed to be practiced. Um, but it's a point where particularly the, the um, people living in the Western part of, uh, uh, of Ukraine uh, come under the influence of, um, uh, of Catholicism. And, uh, and so there's different religious practice that starts to develop uh, as a result of that. The second um, kind of place of influence comes from Moscow itself. Now, Moscow, uh, which is now obviously a massive city, the center of, uh, of, of the world's largest country, uh, is, was um, for much of its history, absolutely really nothing. It was a, uh, it's first mentioned in any historical source in 1147 as a sort of stockade out in the middle of nowhere, uh, but, as the Mongols started to pull back, the, the, the princes of Moscow began to expand ever more uh, the territory under their control. Uh, and you can see in this middle map, they, they, they're not just expanding over a little bit of territory. I mean, they start as a tiny little, and a pea of an island, this little, I don't know if you can see the purple here, and then they start to expand outwards and outwards and outwards. And over time, you know, reaching out all the way to the Pacific, moving south, moving west, uh, so a big part of the story of Moscow's history is this kind of expansion. 
And so as it expands, it does come down uh, into the lands of what we now call uh, Ukraine, bump into the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, and there's kind of fighting and tension uh, between them. Now, um, as you have you know, Ukrainian, what well, we would, the people who now live in the lands of Ukraine, uh, in um, in territory that is being controlled by the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, you have, uh, you have Moscow or Russia expanding their power outward uh, into the same kind of uh, territory. Um, the, uh, we start to see in the, the sort of 17th century, the beginnings of a pushback uh, on the part of, um, uh, on the part of the, uh, the people living in this, these lands to Polish control. Uh, and trying to free themselves uh, and to live a kind of autonomous, uh, independent uh, type of life. Uh, the people who lived in this territory at this point, uh, we often talk about them as, as Cossacks. Um, Cossacks is a term that refers to a, um, a kind of semi-nomadic, uh, semi-autonomous, self-governing kind of communities of people who lived uh, in this region, kind of in the southern parts of what's known as the Dnieper River. Uh, they, it was, was a part of the world, part of the Polish-Lithuanian uh, Commonwealth, where you could live relatively freely. Uh, they developed and built their own um, kind of communities. Uh, they were a mix of all different types of people. There were some of the kind of local Slavic peoples who lived in this region. Uh, there were people from uh, Tatar people, uh, who from the Crimea, who were moving northwards to escape uh, uh, sort of Ottoman control, Turkish control in this region. You had uh, kind of peasants and farmers, serfs who were running down into this area to escape serfdom. It's a, it was a place where you could go if you wanted to kind of get away from wherever you were before uh, to escape uh, and to live a, a kind of freer, um, a freer life. And, and so they, for these kinds of Cossack, I mean, they call them hordes, I mean, bands of Cossacks, people to working together uh, to uh, uh, often you know, making a living sort of through some agriculture, but often through sort of hunting and raiding uh, and this sort of thing. Um, the, uh, the community of them known as the Zaporizhian uh, Cossacks, uh, which were down in this area here, <laughs> Uh, they become increasingly powerful and they start to push back militarily against Polish control. Uh, there's a big rebellion that was led by a man named uh, Bogdan Kmelnitsky, um, who uh, is attempting to kind of push back against the Poles uh, and to claim greater control over this particular area for, for himself and for his, uh, for his Cossack community. Um, and this is, a, this is a painting of him uh, uh, coming in to, uh, uh, to meet with religious leaders. Uh, and um, the, um, what's important about this time period is one, the kind of pushback uh, on the part of uh, the people living in this region, kind of effort to try to separate out from the control of this great power uh, that was, um, uh, that was uh, Poland. Uh, and at the same time though, that Melnitsky realized that they were by no means powerful enough to be able to uh, fight off the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth on their own. And so he sought out a kind of alliance with the expanding Russian power coming down uh, from Moscow. And so they, they signed an agreement, uh, the Cossacks and, uh, and Russia in 1654, uh, and it's known as the uh, um uh, agreement. Um, it's basically it was it was an agreement that, in return for military support and military protection on the part of Russia, uh, Melnitsky um, and the Cossacks agreed to swear an oath of allegiance to Russia. Uh, so it was a kind of trade off. You know, you agree to be loyal to us. We'll send our troops in to help you out in this fight against the the Polish Lithuanian uh, Commonwealth, and. Um, Russia liked this deal a, 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 a lot because it was a, a way for them to, to build support against Polish, uh, the, the, uh, the Polish state. Um, and the Cossacks loved this because then they got uh, one of the other big kids on the block to come help them out in their fight with the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. So 
again, kind of the, the people of this region caught between kind of great powers needing to turn to great powers uh, for support, always in their efforts to be independent, uh, but caught in these kinds of, uh, in these kinds of struggles. Um, from the moment that this was signed in 1654, this agreement was signed, there's been a debate over exactly what everybody agreed to, in the sense that what becomes clear uh, is that for the Cossacks, what they thought that they were saying was, yeah, Russia will help us out, but we're, we're pushing to become independent, become our own sort of state, uh, and to be separate from Poland, uh, but we're not doing this to be a part of Russia. We want to be a kind of separate entity. Whereas Russia is looking at this as, ah, yes, this oath of, oath of allegiance is a sign that, well, they're really part of our state now. They're, they're agreeing to, be, to become part of our uh, territory. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a debate that is ongoing. Uh, and, uh, and many kind of Russian nationalists who believe that there is no Ukraine and there never was argue that you know, this 1654 agreement was an agreement on the part of the political leaders to say, yes, we want to be part of Russia. And so for you know, these 150 years, plus um, the Russian nationalists would argue they have been part of Russia. So, so this moment here of, uh, of kind of debate and uncertainty over what, um, what this is all supposed to mean, but it's a moment where Poland begins to get pushed out, Russia begins to, to push its way in. Uh, to, uh, to, to this territory, territories that are now part of, uh, of, of Ukraine and territories that had been part of, um, uh, of Kiev and the Rus. Um, now, what happens after this is an increasing kind of encroachment of Russian domination, Russian control over these lands, uh, particularly over the course of the 17th uh, through 19th century. So kind of moving, you know, so if we, we had an independent Kiev and Rus, Mongols come in, Polish with the Bohemian Commonwealth comes in, push back on the Poles, now it's the Russians coming in. And once again, the sort of theme of these big great powers coming in from different directions, um, uh, taking control of territory that we now call Ukrainian, um, and um, uh, and in some ways determining the fate of the people in these regions from the outside, we see it happening again here. Now you can see in this map uh, just the different stages by which um, you know, Russia is making its way westward into, into these lands that had been, had been Kiev and the Rus, had been Polish lands, Polish-Lithuanian uh, uh, Commonwealth lands over the course of you know, some in the 17th century, particularly in the latter part of the 18th century uh, expansion into this territory. So this is where, this in some ways is the first moment that we can say, yes, the people who lived in, this, in, in the territory that is now part of Ukraine were ingested into uh, the Russian state at this point. Uh, not always voluntarily, not always with a lot of choice, but they do become uh, part of the, um, uh, of Tsarist Russia, Russia in the time of, uh, uh, of the czars, they get integrated in uh, in this way here, um, but not all of the lands uh, that were that now make up Ukraine became part of Russia. So you have a territory to the west here, um, this kind of grayish kind of color on the map, um, in which a large Ukrainian population lived and lives, uh, and that didn't become part of Russia. And instead, this territory became part of. Uh, the, the Austrian Empire, what's often known as the Habsburg uh, Empire. So they, they come into a completely different state. So you have a big chunk of these region becoming part of Russia over the course of the, uh, excuse me, of the 17th to 19th centuries. And then uh, another part uh, coming into uh, Austro-Habsburg uh, control over here. Now, you ask yourself, why does that matter? Why do we care that it's split in this way? Well, because the experience of the peoples, the Ukrainian peoples living in these two different big, large empires was really different, really, 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 really different. Uh, and, um, and as a result, we see the sort of history of Ukrainians moving in slightly different directions, depending on whether you were in that Western part or if you were in the kind of Eastern part. And what I mean by that is that the, 
people who lived in this area uh, were told that they weren't Ukrainians. They were just simply told that they were Russians. Uh, and in fact, that they were just, they were quote unquote, little Russians. Uh, so it's a bit derogatory, right? Uh, and, um, you know, it's like calling Canadians little Americans. Uh, I don't think they'd like that very much. Uh, but um, the the Russian elites tended to believe that the that the people who lived in this area were just simply Russians who had been uh, who had been in some ways kind of bastardized by Polish influence, uh, and that if they could spend enough time in Russia, they would they would regain their Russian roots um, and just be Russian. Uh, and and so the uh, so yeah, so Russians at this time realized that Ukrainians spoke a bit of a different language, uh, but they thought, well, this is just a leftover of this old kind of Polish period. Uh, and once they're in Russia, they'll, they'll just learn to speak Russian again, and we will all be one happy Russian family. So these ideas that Putin is using today to legitimize the war, saying, well, there are no Ukrainians, uh, these are ideas that particularly developed um, in uh, the late 18th and early part of the 19th century in Russia. So he's just he's hearkening back to a set of ideas um, that have you know, that have some <laughs> some history of their own. Um, what's important about uh, this time too is that the you know initially the Tsar state said, well, they're all Russians, and we don't really have to worry that they speak a different dialect. It will all figure itself out over time. So there were no real efforts to try to stop people speaking Ukrainian or feeling themselves to be Ukrainian um, initially. But by the time we get to the middle part of the 19th century, the Tsarist state decided that they were a little worried uh, that actually there were, there were some Ukrainians in this area who were starting to think in more nationalist terms, who were saying, you know, actually we are Ukrainian, we're different, we don't wanna be Russian, we don't wanna be a part of Russia. And, um, and we start to see then beginning in the 1860s and 1870s, uh, a series of laws that were put down in an effort to try to crush and push out any kind of Ukrainian uh, language, any kind of Ukrainian culture, uh, anything like that. So beginning in 1863, uh, the uh, people who lived in this territory were not allowed to publish uh, in Ukrainian language in any way whatsoever. They had to publish in Russian. Uh, and um, and then uh, and then in the in the 1870s, uh, there's a, a ban on uh, in in uh, on any kind of publication of Ukrainian books uh, and and uh, uh, and efforts to kind of shift any of the educational institutions to teach in Russian rather than Ukrainian. So it's an effort to kind of crush Ukrainian as a language uh, at this point to kind of push it away to help assimilate these quote unquote little Russians into the larger uh, Russian family. So it's a very conscious effort this way. And in response to that, many in, in, in this Ukrainian part of the world um, de uh, decided that they, <laughs> they didn't like this very much at all uh, and, uh, uh, and start to push back against Russian control at this point. So this tension between, you know what, no, Russians saying you're Russian, people in Ukraine saying, no, 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 actually we're Ukrainian, really takes off at this point. Uh, on the other side of, uh, of, of, the, uh, uh, of the, the divide in this kind of Western territory, something totally different happened uh, in the sense that within the Austro-Hungarian empire, uh, there was an opportunity uh, for the Ukrainians living there for political participation. Uh, they were recognized by the Austrian government as Ukrainians, you are a different ethnic group with a different language, you can teach your kids in school in this way. Uh, they were given all sorts of rights and opportunities uh, as Ukrainians uh, in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, and so they, there's a kind of flourishing of Ukrainianness that takes off in the Western uh, territories here uh, that creates very strong nationalist feeling among the people who live there. And we start to see those ideas moving from the West uh, to, uh, to the East. Uh, so really, uh, so that there is a, it's a kind of incubator of Ukrainian nationalism in the Western territories that then is sort of spread uh, to the Eastern parts. Uh, and this sort of divide between West and East remains to a certain degree with the West very strongly Ukrainian. Um, the East, 
uh, also Ukrainian today, uh, but with much greater ties towards Russia historically and culturally. Uh, so this, this, this divide of the, of the kind of 17th through 19th century remains. Um, all right. Uh, there's a moment uh, in the early part of the 20th century where Ukraine actually became independent. It became its own uh, state. Um, the, uh, uh, and this happens in the middle of this, this kind of period of, of, of absolute uh, sort of, uh, war and revolution and collapse, sort of 1914 to 1922. Uh, this is the time of the First World War. It's the time of the, of the Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, in in uh, in Russia, leading to the world's first and at that point only socialist state, um, and uh, and a time of kind of civil wars in a whole variety of places. I mean, it's an absolutely awful mass famine. Ter I mean, a terrible time to be alive. Uh, don't ever, if you get a time machine, go back to this point. Uh, I'm sure it'll be interesting to watch, but it's really hard to live through. Um, in the midst of all of this, though, in 1917, the Tsarist state collapsed. Uh, in the midst of World War I. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, the people living in what's now Ukraine got together and started to think about, well, what should our future look like? The Tsar state's collapsed. What do we want to be now? And <clears throat> they, uh, they meet up in, uh, in the kind of main square uh, in, in Kiev. They set up uh, a parliament, uh, a kind of representative body known as the Rada, uh, for kind of self-government, and they declare themselves kind of, uh, initially they declare themselves independent. It's actually two different independent Ukrainian states, one on the kind of Russian side, another on the, uh, on the Austrian side. So it's the Ukrainian People's Republic and then the Western Ukraine's People's Republic. They come together briefly, blah, blah, blah. You don't even need to, not that that's super important for you, but the important thing is that this is a moment where in the midst of all of this chaos, uh, Ukrainian leaders, uh, in some ways, make the push towards independence uh, to try to set themselves up as an independent state. Now, they don't get much chance to make that happen uh, because of the war and because of the influence of great powers uh, around them. Uh, and so they, you know, they set up a parliament, they set up the Rada, they declare themselves independent, but you're only as independent as people around you will let you be. It's worth noting, I don't know if you can see on the map here, a lot of the fighting on the Eastern Front in World War I took place in what's now Kiev, uh, sorry, now what's now Ukraine. These lands were incredibly important uh, in, um, uh, in, in the First World War, in great part because uh, of their uh, agricultural uh, produce. I mean, this was the Ukraine was by this point the breadbasket of much of Europe and big chunks of the world produced a tremendous amount of grain uh, in this area. Uh, and for all the combatants in the war, getting access to that grain was really important to be able to feed your troops, to be able to feed uh, the civilians that you're with. So there's a real, and this was particularly important for Germany, which was having a really hard time feeding itself in World War I. So getting access to all of this grain, all of these fields of wheat um, was a very important thing for them. Uh, so this territory, you know, as a, as a uh, as, a, as a goal uh, of, 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 of fighting because of its resources um, is, uh, uh, is you know, it's very clear at this particular point in time uh, during this First World War. Uh, and it's a theme that we're going to see again and again. The resources become really important. Uh, and during times of warfare or revolution, political change, efforts to get a hold of these resources become tremendously, uh, are, are really uh, significant. Um, so uh, this is a region then that uh, is tremendously important during the war. Uh, when they declare independence for themselves, the uh, they they're in a bit of trouble, right? They don't, they're in the middle of a war. They don't really have a military to defend themselves. And so they need to figure out who's gonna be their external benefactor. Uh, and in the case of Ukraine, for a variety of reasons, they end up choosing Germany uh, to be their benefactor. So Germany uh, comes in to offer their military support uh, to kind of help Ukraine remain independent. In return, they get a lot of grain, which is great for Germany. Uh, but of course, what this means is that when Germany lost the war and, and, and surrendered in the war in 1918, so Ukraine had lost their benefactor. Uh, in comes uh, the, um, uh, the Bolshevik forces from Russia, 
uh, to take over this particular territory. So you know, for a while, they're protected by the, by the Germans. When the Germans disappear, it's the Bolsheviks who come in uh, and take over uh, these lands. Uh, and this brings us to the kind of beginning of um, the, uh, well, this brings us to the history of Soviet Ukraine. And the Bolsheviks come in, they take over this area. Uh, and, and to a certain degree, uh, what we start to see, you can sort of just have a quick peek at this map. The, the sort of pink lines are the boundaries claimed by the, um, uh, the Eastern independent Ukrainian state. They believed all of this was, was Ukrainian land. The, uh, yeah, the, sorry, yeah, the green lines here uh, were those uh, connect uh, those lands uh, claimed by the um, the Western Ukrainian independent state uh, in um, in sort of uh, 1917 1918 um, and 1919 and so you know this is a moment where they see this they start to think to themselves yeah this is what Ukraine is supposed to look like so there's a moment where Ukrainians are starting to really believe yeah this is our territory this is where Ukrainians should live this is where a Ukrainian state should be. Uh, the Bolsheviks take over, so the Ukrainians are making their own decisions, but, 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 lucky enough for them, uh, the Bolsheviks uh, actually help you, uh, bring Ukrainian territories together and um, uh, set a, put in a kind of set of borders around. Uh, they create what's known as the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, so it's kind of like a, a state within the larger Soviet Union. Uh, it's its own sort of, uh, it's, it's its own kind of political entity that has its own rights and powers uh, and this sort of thing. Uh, so borders are put down uh, on the ground uh, by the Soviet state that creates this uh, Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. They're not independent, but at least they've now got a territory that is very clearly theirs. Uh, and as you can sort of see by these dates here, over the course of the 20th century, um, you know, this green is 1922 when the the, uh, the Republic was created. And then over time, more territory was added uh, to the um, uh, to Soviet Ukraine uh, through Soviet interventions, particularly, I mean, most of these happen in and around World War II, uh, where territory uh, that was uh, that was part of Poland ultimately and some in Romania and uh, and Hungary gets added to um, uh, to Ukraine. This is the kind of western lands of Ukraine. And then in, in 1954, Crimea was uh, was given to Ukraine uh, at this point. So they helped to kind of uh, create uh, a, a place called Ukraine. And perhaps more importantly, the, um, uh, the Soviets introduced a whole series of policies in this region known as indigenization. Uh, and it's a sort of strange word, I suppose, but it's, uh, it's a set of, po of policies where any of the different non-Russian nationalities within the Soviet Union, and there were many, um, were all granted their own territories, uh, and then were granted a whole series of resources to promote their local languages, local cultures, uh, education, uh, and kind of uh, access to and ensuring that local people within, in this case, Ukraine, had access to leadership positions within um, uh, within the political party, within the uh, the state apparatus, uh, it's 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 like a sort of affirmative action program, but on steroids. Uh, it's really something quite remarkable, uh, where the 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 Soviets then are pushing the development of Ukrainian language, Ukrainian culture, teaching kids in Ukrainian, uh, creating history books about Ukraine, uh, and uh, and pushing forward Ukrainians as uh, as kind of leaders. Um, and, uh, uh, and this is part of the reason, uh, one of the things that Putin says in his, in his, his, his historical argument is that actually, um, it's the Bolsheviks that created Ukraine, uh, and what he, why he can get away with saying that is that, well, yeah, there's some truth to these indigenization, uh, policies, plus the borders that they drew helped to create Ukraine as we understand it today. It's not true that there wasn't a Ukraine or Ukrainian people before that, but the Soviets have a big impact in, uh, in that regard. Um, a couple of other kind of moments in, in Soviet history just to kind of highlight. Uh, one is a terrible famine 
uh, that took place in, uh, in 1932, 1933, known as the Holodomor, um, often known as the Terror Famine. Uh, it's, a, um, it's a moment in uh, kind of Ukrainian relations with Moscow where uh, Moscow in some respects turned on Ukraine. Uh, and what I mean by that is that uh, in the early part of the 1930s, the, the Soviet leadership was putting into place an entirely new system of agricultural production known as collectivization, where it was a sort of end to any kind of individual agriculture, uh, any individual land ownership, any individual decision making, and rather all the lands were collectivized into one big kind of communal decision making pool. Uh, resources were, uh, were shared, decision making was shared. Um, and in the process, I mean, all over the Soviet Union, the process of collectivization was awful. Uh, people, um, uh, agriculture production uh, dropped dramatically. Livestock were, uh, were slaughtered by farmers because they didn't want to hand it over to the state. They would prefer to just you know, cut it up and eat it. Uh, and there's a collapse of agriculture uh, all over the place, but it hit really hard uh, in Ukraine, uh, where as many as three and a half to five million people died in this basically uh, year from starvation. This year period, some people estimate even up between seven to 10 million people. There is also a sense that, um, that the folks in Moscow uh, purposefully prevented aid from coming to this region uh, to, so that, that it wasn't just that they had a bad agricultural policy and collectivization, but actually that there was a conscious decision to let the people in uh, Ukraine, and particularly in this area here, uh, die. Um, this event, the Holodomor, is a tremendously important moment uh, in Ukrainian history. It's commemorated uh, every year uh, in November, lighting of candles. You can see the grain here in memory of what happened. It's also important to realize that when today and during the war, when Russia comes in and attempts to grab Ukrainian grain or prevent it from being planted or prevent it from being sold, the memory of this for Ukrainians is one uh, that goes back to the Holodomor, right? That this, that it's, it's a, like they're reliving this terror famine all over again with the way that Russia is treating them. So this is the way they're, th they're understanding these particular events. Another really important moment uh, in, um, uh, in, in, in the Soviet here history is, uh, uh, of Ukraine is, is the Second World War, because much like the First World War, once again, Soviet Ukraine was, at the, was, the, was the fighting ground uh, as the Nazis came in and as the Soviets pushed back. Uh, and as you can sort of see from this photograph here, so much of Ukraine was just destroyed. Uh, you know, these, these are buildings where people can't live, uh, absolutely kind of devastated. A lot of the fighting is taking place in this area. This is uh, one of the hydroelectric dams that was destroyed uh, as part of this process. Um, and so tremendous amount of death and destruction on Ukrainian lands as the Germans came in to try to take it and as the Soviets kind of pushed uh, on their way back out. Uh, and so you know, warfare and destruction is very much uh, at the um, uh, at the core of um, uh, of everybody's memories, uh, and you know, there's still many people alive who lived through this, who are now living through this new invasion. The other thing that that happened on the Ukrainian lands uh, was a big part of the Holocaust. Um, as uh, as much as uh, a third of the um, uh, uh, there was a large Jewish population in Ukraine uh, before World War II. Um, for example, the city of Kiev was about a third Jewish before the war, uh, so that when the Nazis came in with their genocidal uh, policies, you know, trying to uh, eliminate uh, the Jewish population uh, across the planet, uh, the, the Jewish population was, was savagely uh, kind of slaughtered in this area. Uh, and you know, this is a photograph of uh, of the German soldiers and the Nazi soldiers in the Einsatzgruppen just shooting down a family trying to get uh, to get away. Um, there was one of the most famous events, is, uh, or tragic events, is uh, is is it was it took place just outside Kiev in a place called Babinyar, uh, where over the course of two days, about thirty three thousand Jews were were uh, shot in the head into large collective pits that were then buried over uh, to eliminate uh, their bodies and their presence. I mean, it was a slaughter uh, and, uh, and just awful. 
Um, and so, you know, again, this kind of war memory is very much in the minds of, uh, of so many uh, in Ukraine uh, today. Um, the decision on the part of Ukraine in 1991 that they were done with being part of the Soviet Union, that they wanted to break away from Russian control, from Soviet control, was a big part of the reason why the Soviet Union, Soviet Union collapsed, disintegrated in the way that it did in 1991. Uh, so the decision of Ukraine and, and others that they were done with being part of the Soviet Union, they were done with being part of connected to Russia, um, meant that they, uh, uh, that this helped to bring an end to the Soviet Union. Um, and there's a lot of anger on the part of many Russians who have a nostalgia for the Soviet period uh, that, uh, you know, Ukraine was part of uh, ensuring this kind of collapse. Um, it's worth noting in the 1994, uh, the, uh, the Ukraine became one of the few countries in the world to give up nuclear weapons. Uh, and, you know, they had had a lot of nuclear weapons on their territory when they were part of the Soviet Union. In 1994, uh, you know, they, along with Belarus and Kazakhstan, uh, agreed to give up their nuclear weapons in return for various, um, various types of, um, uh, of assurances from, from Russia, uh, from the European Union, and from the United States, uh, that A, they wouldn't be invaded. So Russia has agreed that they wouldn't invade um, uh, Ukraine based upon the Budapest Memorandum, and uh, the European Union and the United States agreed that they would you know, protect and help Ukraine uh, in, uh, in this whole process. Uh, so it's an important moment, and, and Ukrainians particularly look at this as an, as an incredibly important moment in their part because they gave up nuclear weapons, which was in some ways their trump card to protect themselves in return for uh, promises of non-invasion and, uh, and protection, which haven't played out, uh, that's for sure. Um, just watching the time here, let me just sort of quickly just highlight two things about what happens after um, uh, independence. Um, the first is, I mean, the whole kind of post-1991 period in Ukrainian history is one of a great deal of struggle. I mean, there's, starting in 1991, there is an independent Ukraine. It's almost for the second time, right? There's one in, in, uh, in sort of 1919. Uh, there's now another one in 1991. It's obviously been around uh, since then. Like many states uh, coming out of the Soviet period, they struggled to establish a kind of democratic society with democratic rules and norms. Uh, they struggled to establish a kind of capitalist uh, uh, economy. Um, and uh, uh, and there were real issues with uh, with kind of corruption uh, and uh, and you know small numbers of people becoming excruciatingly rich, uh, while others really suffered. Uh, and just I mean you know it's a transition that was hard in in so many places and it was hard in in uh, in Ukraine as well. Um, this all came to a head in two thousand and four in something known as the Orange Revolution, where there was a, a, a kind of you know a national election that was so clearly rigged. Uh, that people took to the streets uh, to demand that that election be overturned and a new one held uh, because there was so clearly corruption that had taken place uh, and that people's votes hadn't been counted properly, that, they, that this, there had been an effort to disenfranchise um, the people uh, in, uh, in Ukraine. Massive outpourings to the point that uh, the people, the Ukrainians, agree, the Ukrainian people in power agreed, yeah, yeah, yeah we've got to uh, we need to rehold this election and to do it much more fairly. Um, in the midst of all this, the, one of the leading candidates um, who lost in the, in the initial rigged election was very consciously poisoned. He was given poison uh, to try to kill him. Um, and I mean, it was an incredible set of stories that happened at this point. But the important thing uh, was that Ukrainians took to the street to demand uh, to demand fair and, and free elections, uh, to demand a say over their future. Uh, and, and they got it. Uh, what's also important about this, this Orange Revolution 2004 is that Russia and, and Putin's government came out against the outcome of it. They said, these people in the streets, these are not freedom fighters, these are not people for democracy. They are fascists, they are nationalists, they have overturned an election, uh, and we will stop at nothing uh, to prevent them from doing this sort of thing again. So 2004 becomes a moment where Russia really took a side within internal Ukrainian politics uh, and, and took a side sort of saying, well, if, if you support this revolution, then you can't be pro-Russia. Uh, and so 
uh, the, this is the beginning of increasing uh, uh, um, Russian intervention into this area. Uh, and Russia sort of saying, no, 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 we're not going to let uh, the people decide what they want here. Uh, we, uh, we, we're going to take a stand against this kind of, uh, basically against free and fair elections um, that would bring in a political leadership that uh, wasn't always exactly what Russia wanted. Um, and this then leads us in many respects to uh, the kind of event that really started the, the war that we're living in today. I mean, I know that seems weird. It started you know, almost 10 years ago. Um, but there was another moment in 2000, 2000, 2013, 2014, where the people of, uh, of Ukraine again took to the streets to demand political change. Uh, in this case, against a sitting government, uh, the sitting government had um, promised to set up greater uh, kind of connections with, with, uh, with the European Union. At the last minute, had changed its mind and was uh, uh, setting up a series of policies to connect Ukraine uh, more closely with Russia. Uh, Ukrainians didn't like this at all, and they took to the streets. And you can sort of see, uh, you know, in this picture here. I mean, the 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 main square, uh, Independence Square, Maidan means means square, uh, filled with people demanding um, uh, political change. They got shot at by the police. Uh, then there's kind of barricades and fighting. Eventually, the president at that time, Yanukovych, was overthrown. They have new elections, kind of brings in the political uh, regime, uh, political uh, kind of setup that they have at the moment. Um, what's important about it, again, is that it's at this moment, uh, once again, Putin and Russia look at this and say, this is completely illegitimate. Uh, this is the mob taking over. Uh, they also, again, said, you know, it's just fascists doing it. This is right-wing Ukrainians. This doesn't reflect the will of the people. We need to, we need to kind of overthrow the outcome of this revolution. Uh, so again, staking greater claim to be involved uh, in, uh, in this particular region. And it was also at this time, sorry, that, um, uh, that Russia invaded uh, and took over Crimea uh, and uh, ingesting Crimea into, um, uh, into Russia. Uh, and uh, so they sent in troops and this sort of thing. So the, the, in 2014, we see the beginnings of kind of Russia trying to take over Ukrainian territory. What we've seen more recently uh, is in some ways a continuation of, uh, of these efforts on the part of the Russian military uh, to take over Ukrainian territory, which of course takes us to today uh, where big chunks of the East and South have been uh, taken over by Russia. Uh, although now, and you can see the, um, this is these territories here. And now, uh, most recently, actually, just the, the kind of purple is the pushback on the part of the Ukrainian forces trying to come back. Um, let me stop there. That's a, uh, that's a really quick uh, overview of Ukrainian history with an effort to try to explain um, what, uh, to explain why it is that Russia's efforts to legitimate uh, uh, to do legitimate their invasion using history as an excuse to do it, uh, miss the point uh, in the sense that uh, there have been, there has been various types of Ukrainian states or definitely various types of Ukrainian peoples that have existed over time. It wasn't just created um, by, uh, by the Bolsheviks in, uh, um, and uh, uh, in, in the beginning of the Soviet period. And if nothing else, there's clearly been a Ukraine since 1991 who have had a, uh, in which the population has a very clear opinion of what they want uh, out of, uh, of their political and economic uh, future. So um, there we go, Ukraine in a nutshell. Uh, everything you want to know, probably a little bit more in some cases, probably a little bit less, but uh, let me know what kind of questions you might have uh, kind of based upon that. I hope it wasn't too fast. I hope it all made sense, um, but there we go. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Brayfogel. Um, wow. As you said, you really put it all together. Um, your, your commentary plus your slides really help us to see things um, more clearly, give us some perspective. I do encourage people, please send your questions through. As we uh, wait for some of those questions to come in, it's um, it was startling to see how many 
how much influence people outside of Ukraine have had on Ukraine um, and how you can see that what is happening today has impacted the rest of the world tremendously because of the breadbasket, because of um, the other resources they have and the access to the sea, et cetera, et cetera. So um, is, is there a part of these periods of history that you have, that you believe impacted Ukraine more than others or that you have found particularly interesting in the series of their history? Well, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I think if we're gonna understand what's going on today, the the three periods of history, there's three, sorry, I'm, I'm a historian. I always say to my poor students that, you know, we're, we're very good at making a short story long. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I think that the three moments that are of particular importance, if, if as we try to understand, Kind of events today. The first is the uh, is really the kind of uh, 18th and 19th century, where we have the t you know the areas of what's now Ukraine divided into uh, between the Tsar state and the Habsburg state, uh, which sets up you know sets up the the kind of different different regional identities within Ukraine. The second is the is is the Soviet period, uh, which is obviously a long stretch, but but particularly because of the ways in which the borders as we understand it in many respects get set during the Soviet period. Uh, these indig indigenization policies, um, kind of affirmative action uh, policies in Ukraine allow for the expansion of Ukrainian language, Ukrainian culture in a way that they hadn't been able to do in the 19th century. The Tsar state had tried to crush it. The Soviets helped to kind of build it up. Uh, and um, and then events like the Holodomor, like the impact of World War II. I mean, these are you know, these are recent events, right? There are still people alive who experience these things and um, in, in, in kind of human life and, uh, and absolutely devastating types of events. Uh, and, um, and then I suppose the third period is the, um, uh, is the post-1991 uh, period where uh, Ukraine, like many of the, the former Soviet republics, was given a chance to be independent. Uh, and they have been working you know, they're like everybody, right? Some days work better than others. Uh, and, um, and some aspects of, uh, of what they work to do have been more, uh, have, uh, have been more successful than others, but they've been, you know, working to, to, to build a 21st century uh, Ukrainian state. Uh, and, uh, and in particular trying to figure out, well, so how to build that up economically, uh, industrially, in terms of energy policies, in terms of, uh, of agriculture, uh, and uh, how to, to build up the state uh, in terms of um, a kind of democratic process and the opportunities for people to take part. I mean, I do think it's, uh, you know, we're, we're so spoiled in the United States that we tend to think democracy is easy. Um, it gets us into a lot of trouble when we think that. Uh, I think Ukrainians, like so many people in the world, have realized how hard it is to build uh, institutions um, uh, democratic types of institutions, institutions based upon the rule of law, uh, to uh, to govern, um, and Ukraine's had to do this um, stuck between uh, a um, uh, a Russia that increasingly, particularly from two thousand four on, has said, "You don't have a right to exist. Uh, we think that you're all just a bunch of, of kind of fascists and Nazis." Uh, and we don't believe in the kind of uh, democratic efforts that you've been pushing forward. Uh, and in fact, really, you've never existed. Uh, so that you know, they've been faced with this choice of, of what to do with a really powerful neighbor uh, that is aggressive and been intervening into their, um, their economy and, their, um, uh, and into their politics. At the same time, that the, increasingly the majority, very clearly the majority of Ukrainians want a future that connects them with the European Union, uh, connects them uh, with uh, the um, uh, with the kind of world of the United States, the West, quote unquote, uh, that this is what they're looking for, but they're sort of stuck between these two and they're given these stark choices uh, of, um, because the Russians are saying, well, if you take anything from the West, you can't be on our team, you can't be, and so that there's, they're faced with this either or reality that has made this whole transition uh, even more difficult and complicated. Uh, 
Uh, and, and so, yeah, I mean, when your neighbor invades and takes a chunk of your territory in 2014, well, that's telling you something about what you have to worry about. So this kind of balancing act between the great powers around them to try to figure out a place for themselves in all of this, uh, that's the kind of third, I think, really you know, significant moment. Um, and of course, once again, they're stuck. Uh, they're, in, they're, they're fighting a war for their own uh, independence, for their own salvation. Um, but they're fighting a war against Russia, a great power on one side, supported by the European Union and the United States, great powers on the other side. Uh, and just what those other great powers are doing is really affecting the choices that Ukrainians have. Uh, so, you know, that pattern continues, that's for sure. Thank, thank you so much. The, um, you've made it really clear that throughout history, they have had to make a lot of very difficult choices and continue to do so. And I also really appreciate your reminder that we are naive about how easy it is to live in a democracy. And it's really been, you know, evident to us recently, we need to do continue with that. I'd like to thank a student from World Civ class who has presented a question, and I think you can all see it. What's going on with Budapest Memorandum now? Is it still in effect? Um, I suppose, uh, yes, uh, in, in terms of kind of legal terms, for sure. I mean, there, there has been this agreement, uh, and it's, it's in effect in the sense that the signatories have still um, uh, you know, the signatories are still part of it and, and the, the nuclear weapons are gone. So that the kind of impact of the, of the memorandum is still there. Uh, it's not in effect, uh, it's so it, sort of legally, yes, it's still there. It's not in effect in the sense that um, basically none of the people who signed it with Ukraine uh, have held up their end of the deal. So that, you know, an agreement is only worth something if everybody follows it. Well, Russia didn't follow it. They've invaded Ukraine now on several occasions. Um, you know, the United States didn't follow it in the sense that they didn't really provide the protections to Ukraine when invasion came from the outside that Ukrainians believed that this, this document um, is supposed to give them the same with the, with the European Union. So there is this sort of sense that, um, yeah, still in effect, but not uh, in the sense that the, the, the that event, which was designed to de denuclearize the world. I mean, I think that in the early part of the 1990s, uh, the United States in particular really believed that the world would be a self safer place if we could narrow the number of countries that had nuclear weapons. And so this was part of a, a policy on the part of the, uh, of the US to try to shrink the number of countries that had, a, had nuclear weapons uh, because they felt like it would make the world a safer place. Um, and so that's, that was the goal there. And, and the memorandum achieved what, what, what the US really wanted, which was for these uh, former Soviet uh, republics, now independent states, to give up their nuclear weapons. They'll send them all off to Russia, where Russia can then decommission them as part of the, uh, the treaties between Russia and the United States. Uh, so in that sense, the, the memorandum achieved its goal, it denuclearized these territories, but kind of protections that were supposed to come along with that um, uh, you know, have not played out in the way that uh, Ukrainians certainly hoped that they would. But it's a problem of being a, a smaller country in the world is that you don't always get to what you want, even when other people promise you things. Um, so, uh, so yes, so yes and no is the short answer there. Uh, and, uh, and of course for Ukraine, I mean, you know, they're, they're now in a war with the nuclear power, right? They're in which affects how they have to think about everything on the battlefield, because as much as we all would love to believe that no one would ever really use nuclear weapons because they're catastrophic, uh, not just for the territory that gets bombed, but for, uh, you know, so much of the environment uh, broadly uh, and for you know, the survival of our planet, really, if they, if, uh, um, as much as we would like to think that's not going to happen, it's still a military option uh, for Russia in all of this. And, and so, and Ukraine can't do much about that. They have nothing to counter uh, that weapon with. So it's a, it's a complicated situation for them, that's for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, would you please elaborate on the Holodomor, this, did I say that right? Particularly, particularly your mention of the Russians, Stalin, possibly deliberately starving the Ukrainians. 
What would be the benefit for the Russians to do that? And does this tie into a similar punishment situation with Russia and the Ukraine currently? Um, yeah, what a great question. So, uh, and I'm so glad you asked because I, 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 of course, ran out of time in the way that one does is one's trying to do you know, uh, a thousand years of history in, uh, in 45 minutes. But um, the, the Holodomor is, is absolutely in part caused by the, the shift in agricultural policies towards collectivization uh, in the sense that the shift from you know, an agricultural structure that had been that involved you know, private ownership of land and, and uh, uh, private decision making about what you would grow and where and, and you know, individual kind of land ownership and this sort of thing to a structure of collectivized agriculture destabilized agriculture across the entire Soviet Union. So that one, so a primary reason for this famine just has to do with this policy. And we know that it's not peculiar to Ukraine because we have there's agriculture problems across the Soviet Union and Ukraine isn't the only place that has uh, a massive famine. Kazakhstan, for example, uh, also uh, suffers from uh, a, a devastating famine um, about half, I think, well, I can't remember, I'm not going to say because I can't remember the exact figure, but it's millions who died from that famine in Kazakhstan, and again, because of the, the shift in, in agricultural practices. But something seems a little bit different in the case of Ukraine uh, and the kind of Holodomor, uh, and the reason why Ukrainians feel that this was more than just bad policy, but that this was in fact a genocide or an attempt at genocide, um, has to do with the fact that <clears throat> If we started in the early part of the 1920s in the Soviet Union with, with a series of policies of indigenization, these affirmative action policies, trying to build Ukrainian culture, Ukraine and, and the culture of other nationalities as well, but build up the language, build up the culture, build up local leadership, build up educational opportunities, all these sorts of things. By the time we got to the late 1920s, um, there was actually a pretty strong Ukrainian national movement within the Soviet Union. I mean, people who really, as a result of indigenization, felt very Ukrainian, spoken Ukrainian, learned in Ukrainian, uh, championed Ukrainian culture, Ukrainian literature, Ukrainian film, Ukrainian arts, uh, Ukrainian history. Uh, and to the point that uh, the leadership in Moscow, Stalin among them, started to worry that actually maybe this indigenization had worked too well. Uh, and that the Ukrainians now, rather than just being you know, sort of happy uh, community within the Soviet Union, we're now actually thinking about leaving uh, and trying to break free from, uh, from, from the Soviet Union. And as a result of that, there is there's some, uh, some evidence that the leadership in Moscow wanted to kind of show the Ukrainians uh, kind of put them down, put them back in their place. So they've helped to build them up in the 20s and then early 30s. Now let's push them back down again to try to, uh, you know, to sort of stifle some of this, uh, uh, this new, this newfound kind of uh, Ukrainian national identity and sort of sense of self. Um, and that it turned out that the collectivization moment was a time that they saw as, as opportune to kind of, to, to kind of turn the thumb screws uh, on Ukraine. So they're already suffering from a famine because of the, uh, the problematic policies. Let's not help them. Let's demand grain comes out. Uh, let's not bring in any kind of aid to the people who are starving. Uh, and let's take that grain and use it for other purposes in Russia uh, to help build uh, industrialization and, uh, and to, to feed people in Russian cities. Uh, but so we'll really take everything. So we, we, the Russian leadership, uh, in Moscow, take everything that we want from Ukraine, use it for our own purposes, and let them really suffer. Uh, so there seems to be pretty clear evidence that there was some conscious decisions to take more grain than really Ukraine could could uh, could handle, uh, and um, and then not help them when starvation became readily apparent. So uh, so part of it is. Um, so sorry, to go back to the reasons for this. Well, part of it is, is this fear of Ukrainian nationalism that had developed over the 1920s. And part of it was uh, a, a, a kind of grab on the part of Russians uh, or grab on the part of Moscow to take grain from Ukraine uh, to use to feed people in other parts of, uh, of the Soviet Union to allow them uh, to have food so that they could build industry and uh, infrastructure and help industrialize uh, the economy. 
Uh, so, you know, when when this happens again now with you, with Russians coming in to take grain, um, you know, this is this falls into a, a very clear understanding of what Russians do to to, uh, to Ukrainian food and the sort of feeling like we've seen this before. The Russians have tried to eliminate us through famine before. Uh, and this is in some ways, uh, you know, this is the fear is that this is trying to happen again. So why food issues are so important for the Ukrainian leadership. I um, mean, obviously because people die if they don't have food, but also because of this historical memory. Well, audience, you're presenting some great questions. Um, and thank you, thank you for the wonderful dialogue here. Um, another student has posted, what do you think will happen with Lukashenko in Belarus? Will he still align with Putin in Russia? And do you think other former Soviet republics as Kazakhstan align with nations other than Russia going forward, China or nations in Europe? Mm. Uh, those are great questions. So let's take the Belarus one. Um, you know, as 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 you may know, there's a of the kind of Slavic countries of of the former Soviet Union. I mean, there's Russia, there's um, uh, there's Ukraine, and then there's another country, Belarus. It's, it's less well known uh, than many of the others, but it's um, uh, it's a big country uh, nonetheless. It has been uh, you know, governed. Basically, since independence in 1991, by the by, uh, uh, by the same man uh, Lukashenko, uh, who's sort of a president for life. They they keep having elections, but are clearly fraudulent elections. Uh, and um, uh, and what's clear is that Lukashenko has um, has kind of made a a, a, a trade off agreement with with Putin and Russia that. Uh, Putin and Russia will help support them. Uh, they'll provide them with uh, with energy, natural gas, and a variety of things at a pretty cheap price. Uh, Russia will provide various sorts of um, uh, of police support and military support to ensure that Lukashenko stays in power. So, you know, keep the economy humming there with with cheap energy, uh, and um, <coughs> excuse me, and help Lukashenko stay in power by. <coughs> Uh, by assisting him in keeping down any kind of opposition. Uh, and so <clears throat> Lukashenko really doesn't exist without Russia, uh, ultimately. Uh, I mean, they have their own internal police forces that are that are doing their own work, but it matters a great deal uh, what, uh, what Russia and, uh, and the Russian leadership have to say. In the most recent elections, um, it seems pretty clear that the opposition uh, oppositional candidate won. Uh, and won by a great deal, uh, and um, uh, and and yet uh, Lukashenko claimed victory. The Russians immediately supported. Uh, came in to say, no, no, no. Lukashenko is the person uh, who uh, who has won this election. Uh, the oppositional candidate um, uh, has you know had to flee out of the country, uh, you know, fearing for her life. Um, and uh, but yeah, it was very clear. Massive demonstrations. Uh, in Belarus, uh, objecting to this, uh, uh, to um, uh, to the fraudulent elections, uh, but they were very actively and aggressively suppressed. Uh, and I think that they, I mean, they're able to be suppressed in great part because of the Russian support. Uh, so you don't see another moment like an Orange Revolution uh, in, uh, in, you know, the Orange Revolution that had happened in Ukraine, where people push back against fraudulent elections. Uh, you don't see that in in. Um, uh, in Belarus, in great part because of uh, the support of Russia and and Putin and the other leadership. So, where does this go going forward? I mean, Lukashenko is in power as long as Putin is, uh, and then we'll see. Uh, and I I think Lukashenko will continue to support, uh, will continue to to uh, to be a very staunch ally of, uh, of 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 Putin's Russia and frankly any Russia that comes along after it, as long as they continue to support him. Without that external. Uh, validation and external support, um, the uh, uh, the Lukashenko's government, I don't think, could hold uh, its uh, its grip on power uh, because it's really clear that they're not particularly popular. And these last elections made that really so. Even even an election cycle where political candidates were arrested so they couldn't run. Uh, the the woman who won the presidential election was the wife of uh, the husband of a political uh, uh, of somebody who had been running for uh, for presidential office who got arrested. You know, her husband gets arrested. She steps in to uh, uh, to run in his place. 
uh, and uh, you know, massive crowds coming out uh, every time they had a political rally. Um, anyways, it's it's very clear that there's very little support for his uh, his government in uh, uh, Lukashenko's government in uh, in Belarus, and so yeah, it's it's only there as long I think as as there is this kind of external Russian uh, support. Um, but as long as there's Russian support, he's going to be a staunch ally of theirs in any anything they want to do. Uh, it seems. Um, in terms of uh, you know other Soviet republics, you meant, the question mentioned Kazakhstan. Um, you know this is a uh, this is another large former Soviet state. Uh, uh, you're very uh, well off in terms of kind of fossil fuels, uh, natural gas, and this sort of thing. Um, you know they border. China. And so, you know, for Kazakhstan, you know, they are, uh, uh, they try to balance their place in the world in particular. I mean, they, they have to have a good relationship with China, uh, in part because China's right there uh, and is a big place and China's a big, um, uh, it's, a, it's a big market for them in terms of uh, uh, and big trade partner. Uh, the same sort of thing with Russia. I mean, Russia's right there. They they have long-standing traditions. There's lots of Russian speakers in Kazakhstan. Uh, they need to have good relations with Russia. Uh, what seems really clear is that uh, at the moment, Kazakhstan is really worried about Russia. Uh, you know, what they want, I mean, what the Kazakh leadership really wants is stability in the region. Uh, and so when Russia... Uh, and China are acting as forces of stability in the region, then good. That's what they want, right? They'll, they'll make friends with these people. Everything, everything stays quiet. Everybody gets to go about their business. Nobody gets overthrown. There's no up, no revolutions, no rebellions, no, no chaos, just stability and order. Now, when Kazakhstan looks to Russia, they think this is not, you know, Russia is no longer a guarantor of stability in the region. Increasingly, they're a guarantor, you know, that what they've done in Ukraine uh, with this invasion is to destabilize the whole region, uh, which makes then, I mean, it seems to make the Kazakh leadership more worried. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's, there's a meeting now, uh, Xi Jinping is, is meeting, right, with Russian leadership, Kazakh leadership. Uh, and I think for the Kazakhs, this is very important because they, they want to firm up their relationship with China to, to try to make sure that they're protected, to make sure that they are able to kind of stay in a kind of status quo in an orderly kind of world uh, rather than uh, a more chaotic one. And so um, the uh, Russia minds less when its border countries connect with China than uh, when the, their border countries connect with the West, with the European Union or the United States. Uh, and, and so, you know, in part because Russia is, uh, is uh, you know, intimately uh, integrated and connected with, with China as well. I mean, it's a huge, huge trading relationship uh, and, uh, and, and an important uh, sort of geostrategic relationship as well. So um, I hope that answers your question. Uh, I think it was a very thorough response and we appreciate your time on that. We'll end with um, a, a question that I'm gonna tie in with another one. Uh, why does Putin call them Nazis? Are they actually right-wing groups or is Putin using this term as propaganda? And along with that, based on everything that you have shared with us about the history, and we also see on the news that um, <laughs> that a lot of Russian citizens um, may believe the world to be different than what you've just presented or, or history, right? Uh, do, you, do you believe at all that Putin really believes this false sense of history based on things he was taught or grew up with, or is he just wisely using it against the world and his people um, as this same kind of prop, uh, mentioned possible propaganda about using the word Nazis? Um. Well, so I'll take the second part of the question first in terms of, you know, do, do they believe it or not? Um, you know, very happily, I am not inside Putin's head. Uh, so I, I, uh, I, I think none of us know exactly uh, what is sort of true belief and what is kind of instrumental use of, um, uh, of, of, of ideas. My sense is that it's a combination of, of, of both of them. I mean, most of us live in a world where 
you know, we believe certain things, but we also kind of put them to use for us in a variety of ways. And often by putting them to use for us, we then start to believe them ever the more. Uh, and, and so, I mean, I do think that, uh, and I do think that there is a belief that there shouldn't, you know, in his part, that there shouldn't be Ukraine, that it doesn't exist, that Ukrainians are, are really Russians. My sense is that he probably believes that to be true. That has a long, long history uh, in, um, you know, that, that goes back to the 18th and 19th centuries. So he's not developing this idea out of nowhere. This is, this has a long standing tradition uh, among certain circles in Russia. So, um, and, uh, uh, but uh, what's very clear is that the, you know, the ability, I mean, you know, the ability to control what's taught in a history classroom has enormous impact on how people think about the world. Uh, and I'm not sure if you noticed, but I mean, a few weeks ago, I mean, the Putin government has delineated very clearly what is acceptable to say and what isn't uh, in the classrooms across uh, Russia. There is a there is a uh, there is a uh, uh, a well, it's a very sanitized uh, and 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 propaganda kind of approach to history. So they're going to teach the history of that I've now argued against uh, and say, well, that's not really what happened, but they're going to teach that history to all of their students. So, you know, there's going to be a whole whole generations of people for whom the idea that there is no Ukraine, uh, the idea that the, the war is justified because of it, um, that there'll be a whole generation taught that. Um, and, uh, uh, and for my own little plea, I mean, it's why it's so essential uh, in any educational setting uh, for there not to be any central organization telling you what you can and cannot say, uh, right? Uh, even a kind of school board telling you what you can and cannot say. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's something. Uh, and so, yeah, there's a whole, so that now there are large parts of the population who simply don't know uh, what the larger part of the story is that we get. I mean, their news is different from ours. Uh, they live in a different news ecosystem and now in a different, increasingly different historical ecosystem. Um, the long-term impacts of that, uh, well, will be long, and we'll we'll figure them out as we go. But I, I can't imagine they'll be good. Um, the question about the Nazis is uh, the short answer is that this is all propaganda, uh, and in the sense that it was very clearly, I mean, for all of us, right? The Nazis are an easy enemy to have, um, and it's very. I mean, you can find, you know, in the United States, people who are who are pro-Nazi, uh, who believe in the in the Nazi and kind of Hitlerite ideology. I mean, we're one of the. Uh, I mean, the United States produces more Nazi literature than any other place in the world, uh, and you know, thanks to our kind of First Amendment and this sort of thing. So there are people who believe that, but it's a very minority, uh, tiny, tiny fragment of minority kind of view. Um, and for most Americans, when you say Nazi, you think bad guy, right? I mean, it's it's easy, right? The Nazis are an easy kind of bad guy, and it was it's easy to kind of think of World War II as you know as a as a war of really good against evil. Uh, and and for the Russians, it was the same sort of way. I mean, the Nazis were the quintessential enemy. They were Nazis were genocidal. They were horrific in their occupation of the Soviet Union. Uh, so. Uh, so it's a shorthand for saying everything that's bad in, 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 in the universe, uh, you just say that as Nazis, right? And, and so it's a way of kind of, tar, you know, of tarring uh, the um, uh, Ukrainians with a, with a kind of feather that you can't argue against. They're clearly all evil if that's the case. Well, they're not all evil. Uh, and um, the, uh, in some respects, the, the, so the, it's, it's propaganda, right? They're not Nazis. Uh, and, uh, now, are there people on the right wing of politics who are part of the Ukrainian political system, uh, who have been voted into office, or who, uh, you know, who have political parties, uh, you know, who have taken part in various kinds of, uh, you know, events like the, the the Maidan in 2014? Absolutely. I mean, it's a there's a full political spectrum in Ukraine, some of whom are on the right of that political spectrum, uh, and uh, and they've been involved now. Again, it's it's a it's a small percentage of the overall political spectrum in Ukraine. Uh, they don't have much in the way of real political power there, but you know, so these people exist, and and that's in many respects what Putin really points to is, oh, look at these people, right? These 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 right wing uh, kind of neo fascist parties. Um, the uh, that's and then they're all like that. Well, I mean, again, we have neo fascist parties in the United States, but no one would really think of them as defining all of 
uh, of, of American politics. Um, the other reason why uh, uh, Putin pushes this agenda is because it goes back to World War II. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is that in during the war, when you have Nazis coming in and uh, Soviets trying to fight them back, you had um, Ukrainian nationalists uh, who wanted independence from the Soviet Union. And so on the principle that the enemy of the enemy is my friend, you have uh, Ukrainian nationalists who joined up with the Nazis to fight the Soviets, to try to push Soviet power away to allow for independent Ukraine. Uh, and, and so again, it's a small group of people, but they're, they're sort of freedom fighters, but who choose to side with the Germans, the Nazis in this particular case, much like they did in World War I. Uh, and um, the most famous of these is a man named Stepan Bandera. Um, and uh, he, he led a kind of uh, uh, a, uh, he, he led a group that were anti-Soviet. So they were pro-Nazi for a little bit, or at least were willing to work with the Nazis until they realized that the Nazis weren't gonna let them be free either. And then they became anti-everybody. And they, the, 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 the Stepan Bandera's group fought against the Nazis, they fought against the Soviets, uh, and trying for Ukrainian independence uh, and self-determination. Uh, groups like the Banderites, um, they're called the Banderites, Banderites um, continued into the post-war period too. So they continued to fight against the Soviet Union after the end of the war. And they were labeled by the Soviets as fascists and Nazis uh, because they had early in the war uh, basically kind of lined up there, aligned themselves with the Nazis as the Nazis came in. Uh, so uh, there's that too, where there's, there, is, there, is, there was a moment in history where a specific group of, uh, of Ukrainian nationalists who wanted to free themselves from the Soviet Union um, aligned themselves with the Nazis uh, and, uh, and so then, uh, the Soviets and then Putin now, um, points to them and say, well, there are all these kinds of people. Uh, and, uh, uh, and of course, you know, they were a small group and more than anything, I mean, they were right wing, but more than anything, what they really wanted was Ukrainian independence. Uh, so they're, they're freedom fighters, but one's on the right of the political spectrum. Right. And so. once again, a demonstration of that need to make a choice. Yeah, it's tough. Difficult. Uh, exactly. And, and what do you do when all your options are bad, right? Yeah. You're in the middle of, uh, of the Second World War. You, got, you either have the Nazis or the Soviets to kind of hang around with. Uh, and initially, people didn't in Ukraine didn't realize exactly what the Nazis were all about. They learned very quickly. Uh, but um, the extraordinary ferocity and violence and, and just horrifying, uh, you know, uh, I mean, genocide that the Nazis unleashed in Ukraine uh, was something that I, I think many people couldn't imagine uh, as the Nazi forces first came in. Um, and, and yet, yeah, this is what happened. And so, uh, so yeah, so that, that explains why he's using that, that term, Putin is. But, uh, you know, today it's really, it's just all about propaganda. It's about picking a, a word and, and a group of people historically that, uh, is, is just a shorthand for everything awful in humanity. Uh, and you, you tar them with that name. Um, and, um, uh, and then uh, that makes it easy uh, for them to kind of just dismiss all of them. But of course, that's not the reality of the, of the politics in Ukraine at all. There are some right-wing people, just as there are right-wing people in every political, uh, uh, in, in any kind of democracy. Uh, but they're not the majority, nor are, <laughs> nor do they have necessarily much influence on, uh, at least on the current uh, government, the way it's structured uh, in Ukraine. So, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Any final comments from you, Dr. Breifogel? Uh No, I mean, other than just to say, first of all, thank you all so very much for coming out today uh, and for sticking around to the very bitter end. I appreciate that no end. I hope that this was interesting. Um, I, uh, curious enough, at, at Ohio State, we run a kind of uh, sort of history, current events lecture series in some ways much, much like this one. Uh, and um, I, uh, and so I just wanted to kind of advertise that that's out there. And I'll, um, I'll let Barbara know when the events start to come, uh, the kind of schedule gets put into place. Uh, and then she can maybe pass on to all of you, uh, if you'd like more of this kind of thing with 
you know, other scholars on other sorts of topics. Um, we're doing kind of something very similar to this, uh, to this great work that they're doing uh, at, uh, at MCC. So um, otherwise, yeah, thank you so very much. If you have any other questions, you know how to track me down. I'm really the only bryophobal around. So, um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and there we go. So thank you so very much. Have a great uh, rest of the day. All right, thank you. We really appreciate your help the audience to learn about very important history and possibly better understand the current conflict that so powerfully impacted our globe. Audience members, it's been an honor to have you with us here today. And I sense that your interest in global affairs is very strong. Um, and we thank you for helping us with your very penetrating questions to even dig deeper. Joe, can you put up the evaluation slide? Thank you. We do appreciate your feedback. The link for that is also in the chat. Um, as a reminder, this is the beginning of our academic year and we anticipate having over 50 virtual programs. If you participate in at least 20, complete the evaluations and provide your contact information, you will be recognized for your dedicated efforts to enhance knowledge for academic pursuits or enrich your path of lifelong learning. And then finally, our next programs start next week. COVID has uh, created a situation where we are not quite ready to have a large, large, large public event on campus. So we again will be virtual with the 31st annual Fort Omaha Intertribal Powwow. And what we've decided to do to help our audience out this year, rather than gathering, trying to gather you together on a Saturday afternoon when you can be at other live events in our community, we're gonna break this down into Monday through Friday with different sessions. And our opening day will be Monday the 19th at 10 a.m. Central Time. And our topic is going to be head dancers. And it will be presented by our two identified head dancer, dancers, Galen Drabo, who's Yankton, and Rebecca Tamayo, Sitangu Lakota. Um, we'll see you at 10 a.m. That's free and open to the public. We will have approximately two sessions daily with the final one session of the Princess Contest on Friday. So see you next week. And if you want to know more about the total schedule, look at mccneb.edu slash powwow, P-O-W-W-W. -W -W. Bye, everybody. Thanks for being with us.